dog. <laughs> Welcome to Japan. Japan. It's massive with way too much to handle in one trip. That's why with the help of my wife Chiaki, who's from Japan, which kinda helps, we will be deeply exploring the middle of Honshu, Japan's main island. Starting in Tokyo, we hit the cherry blossoms in full bloom, along with some rowing, high-rise buildings and plenty of fish. Then we will travel south to Kamakura, a seaside town home to the Great Buddha, and some amazingly peaceful Japanese gardens. Next we soldier on to Hakone, a mountainous area with amazingly clear views of Mount Fuji, along with some interesting forms of transport. We then head north to Shibu Onsen, a traditional village with natural geothermal springs, where the challenge is to dress like it's 1699 and take a dip in nine soothingly hot onsens. This area is also home to the snow monkeys, who make a daily trip to bathe in the natural waters just because, well, why not? We end our trip traveling back to Tokyo for a spot of Mickey Mouse in Disney Sea, an only in Japan Disney theme park, then shopping in central Tokyo and eating more food than we can possibly handle. This is Suitcase Monkey spending 14 days in Japan. One comes around one today. They don't say things the same. I'm taking this look back to London. So this here, correct me, my Japanese is wrong. Meguri? Meguro. Meguro. Ri river. Meguro River. Lots of cherry blossoms. And it's been quite cold this year, so it's a bit later than usual. It's April the 5th today. So we've kind of lucked out. What was really cool to see in Yoyogi Park was all the locals enjoying the cherry blossoms. Japan literally counts down the ever-changing calendar until they can sit down on these blue plastic picnic blankets to create this party atmosphere. After a quick stop here, we headed back to Meguro River to see the sakura trees at dusk and enjoy our first Japanese dinner. This was a seven-course set menu extravaganza, all cooked right in front of us. At this time of year, you have to pre-book to be able to eat here, as it's seen as one of the best places in the area. As with most of the unique places we visit in this video, I have placed a link in the description below. So slightly due to jet lag, we were up at four o'clock this morning. We are going to uh, the fish market. What's it called? Fish market. Tsukiji fish market. Tsukiji fish market. There's a lot of nice fresh fish there. Um, so we're going to start the day off with that and then see where we go. The Tsukiji market is one of the largest fish markets in the world, handling over 2,000 tons of marine products every single day. This area is known as the outside market, whose restaurants and shops cater more for the tourism that has been attracted here over the years. The inner market is where people can witness the very popular tuna auction, which is limited to 120 people per day. Be prepared though to arrive between 2 and 4 in the morning to guarantee yourself a spot here. This is something we weren't able to witness this time, but check out the video description below if you need any further details.
seeing water boats, which we most certainly will have to row. So I've done my back in, <laughs> which means that the lady is rowing us in the boat. Benefit number seven of having Japanese wife on Japanese holiday. She gets to do all of the confusing things while I enjoy coffee from 7-Eleven. Living the dream. Where are we going? Yaskuni Shrine. And what's that? It's a shrine. Lots of <laughs> cherry blossoms. Have more cherry blossoms. More, yeah. Excellent. It's impossible to get tired of looking at cherry blossoms. It's just impossible. They just continue. They all look the same, but they're still great. It's impossible to get tired of looking at cherry blossoms. Just impossible. We are going to Big Camera, somewhere that my wife is very excited about. Massive technology store with lots of crazy tech. Seven floors of madness. So it's a new day. I've really done my back in and I can't really move to be honest. It's a little bit rainy today and uh, we're going to be taking it easy, looking at shops and things like that. I've been taken to a selfie shop. So shit just got real. And <laughs> I'm in agony. And we're going to the hospital um, because I'm in so much pain. Get to see Japanese medical care, a must for every tourist. So that was £170 worth of medical activity. I don't have a broken back. I think I have muscle problems and I'm blaming the 11 hour flight. On with the holiday. Asakusa is a northern district where an atmosphere of a past Tokyo lives. This shopping street runs all the way to the Sensoji, Tokyo's most popular Buddhist temple. This 200 meter avenue provides a variety of tourist souvenirs and local snacks, such as Kiba Dango, an interesting mix of rice, syrup, and sugar, which is a favorite of Chiaki's. Ice cream burger. <laughs> The Sensoji itself is Tokyo's oldest temple, having been completed in 645. By wafting this smoke onto your body, it is believed that that part of you will feel better. I only wish I had known this before spending £175 at the King Clinic only a few hours ago. The 
Tokyo Skytree is the tallest structure in Japan and the highest freestanding tower in the world, measuring up at 634 meters. This height is no coincidence, as the sound of the number 634 when read in old Japanese numbers is Musashi, which is the same name as the old Japanese province that this part of Tokyo belonged to. This was also our first glimpse at Mount Fuji, something we will be seeing a lot of in the near future, resting a cool 150 kilometers away, which means that Mount Fuji is big. Later that evening, we went to Ebisu, a few stops from Shibuya, to have dinner at a place called Wan. Here we got to enjoy our own private dining room, sitting on tatami mats with a low table. Wan is an example of an izakaya, a sort of informal gastropub for Japan, commonly visited after work. Here, food is served in a tapas style, mostly made for sharing. Wan is part of a popular chain, so prices are reasonable, and I've linked to it in the description below, as overall it was great value for money. So it's pouring with rain this morning. We are leaving our Airbnb place in Tokyo and we are going, getting a train to Kamakura, where it's a bit more kind of oldy school Japanese-y. So um, we'll see you on the other side. After a couple of train changes and only 60 minutes south of Tokyo, we arrived in Kamakura, where we would spend the next 24 hours. Kamakura is a small seaside town, sometimes referred to as the Kyoto of Eastern Japan, due to its numerous temples, shrines and historical monuments, as well as sandy beaches in the summer. This is a great contrast to the big city, and the change of pace is welcome, such as checking in at our hotel, or Ryokan, using this telephone service. These statues are known as Jizu. They are seen as a patron deity of the deceased young and unborn children. These statues are sometimes dressed in bibs or handkerchiefs, or have children's toys placed with them by visitors praying for their children. Inside this room are rotating book racks called Rinzo, where important Buddhist sutras are kept. By turning the Rinzo, it is said that you can earn the same merit as from actually reading all the sutras, which is great news for me as I'm more of a movie guy. The Great Buddha is a bronze statue standing over 13 meters in height, making it the second tallest of its kind in Japan. The statue was originally located inside a large temple, however due to multiple typhoons and tidal waves, it now sits in the open air. One unique factor of the Great Buddha is that you can actually go inside the statue.
toilet. We have many controls that... Whoa! Something's just happened. Oh. I don't know, I moved near the toilet and something happened. Yeah. Let me move towards it. <laughs> so I'm trying out. We have hard spray and soft spray. I'm trying out the soft spray on the warm toilet seat. Very nice. It's like a roller coaster, very apprehensive before the moment hits the relevant area. Very soothing. And I can change the velocity. Okay, so we have. What's that one? The female part. Hard. Is that wide vagina? Normal. Normal vagina, wide vagina. Are you allowed to say vagina? <laughs> I can say vagina. So let's try wide vagina. See what that's like. See how that differs. <laughs> okay, no more of that. We've upped the game. We've added massage in. <laughs> After feeling cleansed, we had one of our best dinners into the trip so far. Matsubara has a very authentic feel to it, with low tables and amazingly tasty food. As with most of our trip, I have provided links below as I would really recommend you make a stop here if you're in the area. Heading back to our room, a nice little quirk of staying in a ryokan is that they always know when you have left the room. This allows for the staff to make a quick change of furniture from dining table to bedding. Another perk is that the food is some of the highest quality and usually included as part of the experience. This is indeed a breakfast fish I will get to know very well over the coming week, but I can think of worse problems to have. As we had come to expect upon returning to our room, the beds had magically disappeared and we were back to the day setting. It was, however, time for us to move on again, and this time we had Mount Fuji firmly in our sights. <laughs> Literally just arriving. This is like our only proper hotel with private onsen and views of rainyness outside. We've got a ladder in case we need to change the light bulbs. <laughs> and these are the, uh, the views of Mount Fuji. Ready for my bathing experience. This is the hotel entrance when it's not raining. We're pretty high up in the mountains. It's a bit cold. <laughs> We've literally just turned a corner and Mount Fuji's right there. Look at that. That's amazing. <laughs> literally had no idea that was there. That's amazing. <laughs> so this is our onsen where we were last night. And right on the balcony this morning, we have Mount Fuji. Yeah. Room with a view. 
With the excitement of clear skies, which isn't always guaranteed in this region, we headed out to sample our first of Hakone's three unique modes of transport, all of which helped to create a triangle of travel around the area. The ropeway was our first, probably giving us my favorite view of Mount Fuji. Wakudani is an area surrounding an active volcano where sulfurous fumes, hot springs and hot rivers can be experienced. There are normally hiking trails around this area, but due to higher than normal volcanic gases, this was all closed off when we arrived. Wakudani is also known for its interesting cooking lessons. You can purchase fresh eggs, boil them in the naturally hot waters, and the sulfur turns the shells to black and are said to prolong your life by seven years. I'm not sure how much the magnificence of Fuji comes across from just seeing it on a screen, but it really is a breathtaking sight and I apologise for its hogging of film here. But seeing something 35 miles away fill so much of your view is an odd feeling. As it sat on the clouds, almost magically floating, we couldn't help but just stare continuously with a wow. While, of course, taking the odd selfie. After we had gotten slightly used to the sight, it was also fun to see everyone else react to the same feeling. Check out this quick bus journey we took as everyone sees the mountain come into view for their first time. That's what we did. We've already seen it. We've seen it already. It's very good. <laughs> Jackie's very excited. As can be seen, Chiaki was very excited to sample Hakone's next unique form of transport, the pirate ship styled Hakone Sightseeing Boat. This is about a 30 minute journey and takes you from the north of Lake Ashinoku to the south. At its destination, Hakone Machi is a tiny town with a sprinkling of restaurants and shops, which we briefly explored. Hello. Hello. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. We are in Hakone. By now it was late afternoon and we needed to take our bags from one hotel to the next, moving to the more populated part of Hakone known as Yamoto. This allowed us our last close-up view of Mount Fuji as we took to the ropeway one last time. It was then the Hakone Tozan Railway that completed our third unique form of transport. It consists of two different trains and takes you down the very steep mountain. The higher cable car, as it's known, lowers itself 211 meters in a virtually straight line, covering three quarters of a mile in only 10 minutes. All in all, this creates a sharp decline to travel at. Following a quick change, the Hakone Tozan train takes over, taking us 450 meters lower over 40 minutes. During the ride, the train does a 180 and changes direction three times. These switchbacks are where the gradient is too much to handle as a corner, so a zigzag approach is much more efficient. After pulling into its final stop, we had arrived at Yumoto, Akane's most famous hot spring town. Yumoto has a large number of natural hot springs, causing many visitors to make a day trip from Tokyo. After a picturesque walk, we arrived at our new hotel, again up a steep hill, and rested before the night's big meal.
so slight change of plan due to the inclement weather which we are having. So we've kind of chopped and changed the days around a little bit, uh, taken out Matsumoto because it's a bit cold up north and the cherry blossoms have kind of not bloomed yet and we've already had some cherry blossom action in Tokyo but they're still great. So we've changed that around, added on a day in Shibu Onsen and added on a day in Tokyo. Today will be a relaxing day, we're going to a bakery now, might have a bit of a wander of the shops and then we are massaging and we are onsening once again. So lots going on. There are a number of items that populate areas around a shrine. These wooden plates are known as Emma. Visitors write their wishes and leave them at the shrine in hope they come true. Omikuji are fortune-telling paper slips, like fortune cookies. Randomly drawn, they contain predictions. By tying the piece of paper around a tree's branch, good fortunes will come true, or bad fortunes can be averted. After a quiet day of shopping, fooding, and onsening, we had our longest day of travel ahead of us, moving from the south of the Kanto region towards the north of the Chubu region. As is usually the case in these situations, the blue skies beamed down on us as we took to the station for our first of four trains. It was here that we noticed the change in temperature that we were about to endure, moving from a cool 12 degrees to a not so cool minus four degrees. This was also our first experience together on a Shinkansen, or bullet train. Travelling up to 320 kilometres per hour, they are an experience in and of themselves. They usually depart to the second, and the ample leg room and space for snacks makes the journey feel first class. Japan's train stations have a great assortment of food, so it's always fun stocking up before a journey, again making the experience feel premium. A good Japan travel tip is to make use of their love of lockers. At most train stations are a mixture of coin-operated lockers and concierge services for your bags. Since we would only be in the north for two nights until returning, we left our bags in Tokyo. The company would hold them and then deliver to our hotel on the day we were due to check in, which made the long commute all the easier. After a brief stop in Nagano, which was home to the 1998 Winter Olympics, we took our final train towards Shibu Onsen. Shibu Onsen is a small hot spring town that gives about as close representation of stepping back in time as you can get. For hundreds of years, samurai and high-level guests have traveled here to sample its naturally hot, soothing waters. Access to these hot waters are by obtaining the town's master key, but more on that later. Given our new location, it was also no surprise we were about to check in at a family-run ryukan with all the traditional trimmings. So what do you do? Just sit here and stick your feet in. Try it. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah, that's, oh, that's like toasty super warm. Yeah. I feel like it's in another dimension. What do you mean? Well, here is in this dimension. Yeah. And this is like some black hole dimension of heat. After stepping back into this dimension, we were treated to some private dining in our ryokan. With numerous portable heaters blasting away, we enjoyed a delicious home-cooked eight-course meal. So this is the world's softest pork. You can literally just...
This is our beds that have been created while we were sleeping and I've put extra long duvet here for my feet. Very nice. We have another amazing meal for breakfast. Um, we're gonna go over to uh, see some snow monkeys uh, as they bathe in their natural habitat. So we need to get, get a bit of a bus to get there um, and then a bit of a trek and then we'll, we'll see these crazy monkeys. The Snow Monkey Park offers visitors the rare experience of being up close and personal with wild monkeys while they bathe in the hot spring waters. Every day, around 150 of the so-called snow monkeys make the trip to this area to enjoy some relaxation and nitpicking. They are very comfortable with humans, and due to everyone generally following the rules in Japan, the monkeys have no reason not to be. This allows for an experience like no other, with a serene environment of primates and humans living together while also enjoying their antics. For a history lesson, it was 1964 when the park was established. The local townspeople noticed that every day, groups of monkeys would head to the hot springs. The people then built this man-made open air bath for them, and the routine was secured from then onwards. There is also a very strong leader within the group, which we guessed to be this little fellow here. All the monkeys respect the boss, and he will always be fed first by the park. This noodle place has earned our seat due to it being the only restaurant open in the whole town. Just going out for our onsen with our towels and well that's it really, just yeah. our towels. The yukata is a casual version of the kimono, typically worn in ryukens and especially in onsen towns. These gita or wooden clogs complete the outfit and finally allowed me to show off those high heel skills I developed back in the 90s. Literally meaning bathing cloth, the yukata is perfect for quickly getting naked for some hot spring action. Now that we are ready for the onsen, we need access. Shibu Onsen contains nine public bathhouses which are all accessible by the town's master key. The way you get this key is to be a local or to stay in one of the town's ryokan, which means that crowds are less likely. We were very lucky on the day we went, being that we had all nine baths completely to ourselves. Men and women are separated by a wall, but as long as you are alone, you can hear each other as you're in the same space. The overall challenge is to visit and bathe in all nine onsens. After your body heats up with the first onsen, the cold weather is actually welcomed between the stops. Each onsen also has its own stamp. After you have bathed, you can mark this stamp on a tenugui, or hand towel, as a memento. After a few more train journeys, we returned to Tokyo for our final few days. The first thing we noticed was how much difference a week can make in terms of missing the cherry blossoms at full bloom. You can get a nice mix of greens and pinks, however, as well as floating leaves carried by the wind, but it reminded us how lucky we were to catch them just right. But mainly, the biggest difference was that over two hours, the temperature had jumped about 20 degrees, causing this dramatic undressing. With our bags hopefully still being delivered to our hotel, we were free to enjoy being back in a populated city and all the benefits that that brings. We made the most of the food, the sights and the shops as much as we could, with Chiaki purchasing a new mirrorless camera for a lot less than she would have paid in England. 
A quick Japan tip is to always carry your foreign passport with you while shopping as getting 8% tax off in most stores is a fairly easy process. So, we've been without our bags for two days and they should have been taken from Tokyo Station oh, no, this is all very nice. to Tada! That's amazing. <laughs> So we're only here for one evening as a quick stopover due to the change of plans we did in Hakone. So this is a bit of a last minute booking before we go back to original plan for the last few nights in Airbnb place. One restaurant I would definitely recommend is Toraji in Ebisu. This is a yakiniku experience which literally translates to grilled meat. Each table has its own grill and you are supplied with the raw meat freshly prepared and seasoned. This allows for the freshest flavour as grill to mouth is a matter of seconds. All the smoke is whisked away by this clever extractor fan above you. Ironically, this meat restaurant is also where I experienced the nicest tasting cucumber. I have linked below for details. We are now walking to our last Airbnb location, back on the original schedule, the last couple of nights in Tokyo. After collecting the key and settling into our tiny Airbnb room, we were able to feel more like a local than ever before. The location was a brisk 10 minute walk from Shibuya Crossing, but somehow felt like a million miles away with its quiet neighborhood streets. 10 minutes in the other direction, and we ended up at Yoyogi Park early in the sunny Sunday morning. This was a massive contrast to when we were here last during sunset and at the peak of the cherry blossoms. We grabbed some picnic food and watched the people of Tokyo take a rare, relaxing breather. After the rest, we tried to squeeze as much life and action out of Tokyo as we possibly could. It was a solid case of shopping, Shibuya crossing, a custard cream pie, some shopping, a latte, a quick train, a Mexican lunch, Mario Kart, shopping, a spot of dancing while shopping, some iced tea, another train, looking generally cool, Shibuya crossing, some cake, a meatball sandwich since by this point I was gagging for something that wasn't rice, shopping, shopping, couple more lattes, a cocktail, discovering narrow streets, Shibuya crossing to get to some more shopping, and finally a train to get to Akihabara. Akihabara is known as the electric city and for a very good reason. It's the center for gaming, manga, and anime culture in Japan, with its electrical shops, arcades, and maid cafes, to name a few. To end the evening, we found this great little conveyor belt sushi restaurant. 
Most food would move past you on the lower conveyor belt with the plate color signifying price. However, you could use your tablet to order fresh from the specials menu, causing the food to whiz past you minutes later. For sushi, this was a great place and it was one of the cheapest eats we had while in Japan at the price of only £20 in total. Dining can be inexpensive in Japan since you are almost always offered water as you sit and tips are never expected or even welcome. As before, I have placed a link below. How is it possible that Shibuya Crossing can look like this? The answer lies in a trade-off that Chiaki and I came up with, which was that we could spend lots of time shopping, shopping if we could then spend a day at Tokyo Disney Sea, and furthermore, waking up at 5:30 a.m. in order to not just do Disney Sea, but do Disney Sea, which is how Shibuya Crossing can look like this. I'm a bit of a fan. Disney Sea only exists in Japan, and it took me a while to realize that the sea was in contrast to Disneyland, with a nautical theme running throughout the entire theme park. I will be making an in depth guide on Tokyo Disney Sea around summer 2017, so definitely subscribe for more details if you're interested. We have already posted numerous videos of our time in Disneyland Paris, so check those out if you're interested too. For the purpose of this Japan movie, I will provide more of an overview here. Tokyo Disney Sea, while still being quintessentially Disney, is more aimed at adults than children. It is actually one of the most popular dating locations for couples to visit in Tokyo. There are also more sit down restaurants than in the neighboring Tokyo Disneyland, and something pretty unique for a Disney theme park, they serve alcohol. Another interesting point to separate itself is that it isn't actually owned by Disney. Instead, Disney licenses its characters to be used by the Oriental Land Company. As someone who has been to almost every Disney theme park, one of the great aspects of Disney Sea was that it was almost completely unique in terms of its rides, shows, and theming so it felt strangely enjoyable to feel like a fish out of water. We were able to end the night on the familiar, yet always great, Phantasmic show, which rounded off our 14 hours of being inside the park gates. The trade-off was worth it. Japan. It's a country that has almost everything in spades. For the nature, cherry blossoms provide the perfect background. For the practical, the Snow Monkey Park is a perfect blend of turning something man-made into a home for its natural inhabitants. For the tech-minded, Akihabara is your very own playground, along with Tokyo's skyline making a powerful impression. Despite this looking ahead, Japan still has a very firm grip on its history and tradition. For the peaceful, the temples and shrines momentarily take you out of one of the most populated regions in the world, along with natural hot springs heating you up while the cool winds keep you grounded. For the foodie, presentation, preparation and peculiar are king, providing an interesting mix of flavors and fun. There is nothing this country doesn't offer from a visitor's point of view, and I know we have barely scratched the surface. The keen-eyed amongst you may have noticed we are still on Act 1 of this story. That's because we will be visiting Japan over the coming years and making the most of each region as we go, so please subscribe to catch future editions of our story in Japan, as well as previous movies in Kenya and Rome, to name a few. If you have enjoyed this movie, I would really appreciate if you would like, comment and share. This has been Suitcase Monkey spending 14 days in Japan.